Yeah, I think we can gently start this final session. Hi everyone, welcome back. So yeah, like I said, it's a final session of this year's HIPCON. Do stay after for the closing ceremony. We will have some beautiful rewards to give out by our sponsors. Uh, Sumit Gulwani is here from Microsoft. He will be talking about a new paradigm called Programming by Examples. He's also founder and leader of Pro's research and engineering team over at Microsoft. Can you tell us more about the Pro's team? What do you guys do over there? <coughs> so it's a, a, a team that is diverse in two aspects. One is the technical expertise that we have within the team, which ranges from machine learning, programming languages, software engineering, human computer interaction. And also it's a team that is diverse in roles. So we have not only researchers in the team, but also engineers, program managers, user experience designers. And we also work very closely with customers, whom we also think are part of the team sometimes. It's brilliant background and brilliant topic to close this uh, conference. Thank you very much, Sumit. Thanks. <coughs> Hello, everyone. 10 years ago, I was returning home from a conference in Germany, flying from Frankfurt to Seattle. And there was a lady sitting next to me in the airplane. She was very impressed to know that I have a PhD in computer science and that I work for Microsoft Research. So I ought to help her with the task that she was struggling with. She opens up her laptop, fires up Excel, shows me a column of strings in the form first name space last name, and asks me how can she transform it into a different format, last name comma first name. At that time, I had no idea about the programming model underneath Excel. So I had to excuse myself out of the situation. But after I got back home, I tried to look for a solution to that problem. And it is then that I realized that there were many, many people like the airplane lady who were struggling with simple repetitive tasks like what she was struggling with. And here is how a typical interaction would go on a help forum. An end user would ask the expert to give them a program that can transform this string on the left side of the arrow to the string on the right side. The expert takes a look at this input-output example and sends back a program that can extract the first two characters, starting at the fifth one. The end user takes this program and runs it on other inputs that he has and figures out that it does not do the right job on another input that they have in the spreadsheet. So they send a second input-output example pair to the user, or to the expert. So what do you think is the end user trying to accomplish here? Yes, so extract the sequence of characters between the first two occurrences of the underscore. How many of you know how to accomplish this using the APIs that Excel provides? This is one of the simplest program that would work. The end user takes this program and runs it on their spreadsheet and is happy with the results and sends a thank you note to the expert. This interaction takes place over a course of a few days. And this inspired me to develop a technology that can play the role of the expert on the health forum, reducing this interaction to a few seconds. So let me show you a demo of this flash fill feature that has been in Excel since 2013 onwards. So here I have a collection of numbers. Suppose I want to format them by inserting hyphens and by masking off a few digits, as you see in the second column. If there are hundreds and thousands of rows, then doing it manually would be very cumbersome. A principled way to do this would be to write an Excel formula. But 99% people who use computers, who use spreadsheets, 
would get stuck because they would not be able to program these kinds of tasks. So now you can simply provide an example of what you want and press Control E to fire this feature. So the underlying technology takes a look at this input-output example that you provided, generalizes it into a program, and executes that program to automate the task for you. The Excel team did quite a good job at avoiding the so-called discoverability issue. So suppose you don't know that this feature exists, and you're trying to do a repetitive task. The moment you do the second instance, the system auto-fires. It realizes that you have a repetitive intent in mind, and that you're not trying to create an arbitrary column, but the column that you're trying to create is a derivation of some input column. And you can simply press Enter to accept the results. Now, in general, it is too good to read the mind of the user from just one example, as this scenario would illustrate. Here I have a bunch of medical billing codes, some of which have a right bracket at the end and some of which don't. Suppose you want to clean the data by adding a right bracket wherever it is missing. So if you give one example, and another way to fire FlashFill is to go to the Data tab and click FlashFill. The, simple, the system comes up with the simplest generalization, which is to add a right bracket everywhere. Maybe this is what you want, and you are done. Otherwise, you will observe that row 6 to 10 are incorrect. And you can fix any one of these, which is like giving a second input-output example to the tool. And now the tool can convert to the intent that you have in mind. You can use it to extract different fields from large strings. Even if you are a programmer, thinking about the logic will take a lot of time. And now all that you have to do is to give an example and press Control E. The tool can synthesize quite complicated scripts, in particular scripts that contain loops. So here I'm iterating over the input string to generate an abbreviation. And one example suffices. So you can do lowercase, you can put periods, you may not have a spaces, you can do in reverse order, and it will all mostly work. So FlashFill is a very popular feature. There are around a million invocations of it in a week. Now, while I have been trying to impress you on the different kinds of tasks that FlashFill can handle in the space of string transformations, there are many, many tasks that it cannot handle. For instance, number transformations or date transformations. But the user experience is so inviting that it doesn't prevent people from trying it on tasks that it was never meant for. And then when it does not work, people get disappointed and make fun of this feature. So recently, there was a tweet on October 2018. <laughs> Sorry, I mean October 2018, where someone made fun of the flash feature and said, look, AI is going to take over the world. But this is what Excel auto-populated for me today where someone gave an example to map DEC to December, and then the system auto-completes JAN to Janember and OCT to October. In fact, some people even came to the rescue of this feature by saying, this is how months should be named in the first place. <laughs> but the best thing about this kind of customer feedback is that it tells us about the new domains that we ought to develop these program synthesis capabilities for. And this is what we have done in the new FlashFill++ feature that we have. So now we can automate transformations that are more than string transformations, such as number transformations. Even for a task as simple as rounding of a number, if you have to program this in Excel or C Sharp, you need to remember this format descriptor. In Python or C, it's something else. In Java, yet something else. But again, examples can be a very natural way for you to specify your intent. And from a couple of examples, we can automatically discover these format descriptors and automate the task for the user. Here is another scenario which might be common in data science, where I have a string in the input column, and I would like to extract the red date and map it to the corresponding weekday. 
and extract the green time and bucketize it into a three-hour time bucket. Just imagine how much code you will need to have to write in order to map the input to the output. But these kinds of tasks we can now enable with just one example. Now, besides map operations, what else can we enable with programming by examples? How about filter operations? So here is an assignment taken from a popular data science class where the instructor challenges the students to take this custom text file and extract tabular data out of it, or CSV data out of it. The instructor provides the students a script to build on top of. Now let me show you how a programming by example experience might look like for this scenario. So I've loaded the same file here. And all that I need to do is to give one or two examples of the various fields that I'm interested in extracting. So let's say I want to extract the championship name. And the moment I provide two examples, the system generalizes it into a script and executes it on the data set to extract other instances of this field. In order to extract a different field, I simply change the color of the label. And now one example suffices because my previous interaction is starting to put some structure on the document. Now, this kind of interaction can be used to extract structured data from different kinds of semi-structured documents. Instead of a text file, we can even have a JSON document, or a web page, or even a PDF document. Let me make a similar case for extracting data from semi-structured spreadsheets. So let's say you have a table like this, which you would like to reformat into a more structured form, as you see on the right side. And again, if there are lots of such entries, then doing it manually would be very cumbersome. And writing a one-off script to automate the task may not be very exciting. But this is, again, a scenario that can be automated from just few examples of rows in the output table. And the reason why this is very significant is because 50% spreadsheets are semi-structured. Think of large financial spreadsheets with lots of subheaders, white spaces, colors, formatting. In fact, some consulting companies hire hundreds of people to manually normalize these kinds of spreadsheets. So let me show you how an experience based upon programming by example might look like for this. So what I have here is the list of top-cited authors for the conference Popul 2015. And then a similar list repeats itself for many different editions of this conference. Suppose I want to figure out who is the most cited author across all of these conference editions. So if all of this data was in a proper structured tabular format, then I can write a SQL query, or I can use our programming by natural language technologies to be able to answer these questions. But unfortunately, this data is logged up in a semi-structured format. But no worries, we can use our programming by example technologies to automate this task of extracting structured data out of it. So now I'm telling my tool that I want to create an output table with three columns. The names of these columns don't matter. And all that I need to do is to give examples of various entries that should go in this output table. So this is one example of a tuple. And then I will provide another example from down below to make it more representative to the tool as to what I'm trying to do. And now from a couple of examples, the system is able to generalize my intent and extract other such tuples from the spreadsheet. Now let's take a look at how these different technologies work. So at the heart of each of these different program synthesizers that I showed you, string transformations, date transformations, number transformations, extracting tables from log files, extracting tables from web pages, extracting tables from semi-structured documents, underneath each of these systems, there is a search engine which maps the user-provided examples to a program. And it searches for a program in an underlying programming language. 
Now, these are not the programs that are in some database, but these are programs that are defined mathematically by an underlying programming language. The challenge with searching for programs in a general purpose programming language is that the programming language is huge, and the search won't be scalable. So the first idea that we use is to restrict the search to an underlying domain-specific language, which provides the right set of abstractions to accomplish tasks in that domain. For instance, the domain-specific language underneath Flash Fill consists of operators like substring, concatenate, regular expressions. Now, searching for programs in this domain-specific language isn't easy either. It's simpler than searching for programs in a general-purpose programming language, but it is still quite challenging. And the Excel team wasn't willing to ship Flash Fill unless we made the performance of this synthesizer to be under one second and more like 0.1 second. So to do that efficient search, we leverage logical reasoning. In fact, properties of the various operators in this domain-specific language to make the search much more efficient. It is very much like a back propagation over the domain-specific language, where we push the examples down the structure of the grammar using the inverse semantics of the various operators in this language. And then the paths that remain uh, are the, uh, describe the valid set of programs that are consistent with the examples that the user provided. We also use various heuristics to make this search more efficient by guessing the right choices during the search process. But then what you get out of this is not one program, a set of programs, each of which is consistent with the examples that the user provided. So the second aspect inside the underlying engines is that of a program ranker. So we need to rank these programs and then pick the top ranked program for automating the task for the user. So the first version of Flashville that I developed used to take three to four examples per scenario. But the Excel team told me that if you don't make it work with one example for most simple tasks, then we cannot really ship this, because otherwise people are going to make fun of this technology like you see this tweet. So we ended up developing an interesting set of techniques to be able to rank these programs based upon various program features. So programs that are smaller, simpler, use fewer constants, are more preferred ones. We also use features of the outputs that these programs generate. So let me just show you a demo of how good the ranking scheme inside Flashville is. So here I have a bunch of names. If I want to extract the first character, I just give one example. What do you think I'm trying to do in this column? First two characters, and here it is, first three characters. So each invocation of Flash Tool is independent and doesn't take care of the history. So if you didn't watch me doing these other things, what is your most reasonable guess what am I trying to do in this column? The first word, right? the first name, and not the first four characters. And this is exactly what the system thinks. But if you really want the first four characters, you give one more example, and then the system will do it for you. My favorite is this one, where I'm trying to compute initials. And the system is smart enough from just one example to realize that the lowercase f in j dot f dot is the lower casing of the capital F in the last name, and not coming from the lowercase f's that are there inside the first name. And then, in some cases, it is also important to provide some debuggable experiences to the user and help them identify the various corner cases that exist inside their data set. And this is often made possible by the presence of other inputs that are available on which the user might want to run these programs. And the fact that we have not produced one program, but many programs. So for instance, if the system produces, let's say, two different programs, which are each of which is highly ranked, we can execute both these programs on the remaining inputs that the user has in parallel. And if they happen to give the same result, it doesn't really matter which program you pick. But if they give different results, that's a signal that there might be some ambiguity or corner cases that can then be surfaced to the user. <coughs> and then we can even use other clustering kinds of techniques on inputs and outputs to identify such corner cases. So this helps the user to provide more examples and then the process can be repeated and concluded with getting an intended program in the underlying domain-specific language. 
So let me show you an experience around this disambiguation uh, utility. So recall this demo where I was trying to extract tabular structure out of a log file. Now let's say I want to extract these cores. So if I give one example, the system gets it wrong in the third record and, and some other records as well. So I can give one more example and fix it, and it will work. But what if this error was somewhere in the middle of your document, middle of your big document? If you are a programmer and programming this task yourself, you might not even realize that these mistakes have been made, and you might end up computing wrong results. But in this world, we can do better. Here, we are not committing to a specific program. We are actually programming by intent. So we have synthesized multiple programs that we can leverage to figure out where the ambiguities are. So if you go to the disambiguation tab, it actually highlights this third record and asks you, do you want a different choice instead? So I almost want this, but without the leading space. So I'll give one more example. And now the system is able to correctly extract all these scores for me. Next, I'm going to talk about three innovations on top of this architecture, where the user is going to specify even less and get something that is even more than what the user gets here. So let's see what less can we specify than examples, and what more can we get than an intended program in the domain-specific language. So there are tasks that people might not even realize are programmable tasks. For instance, you might have a Word document, and you might want to convert all red text into, let's say, green text. Or there might be cases where someone might do a task once, and only after doing it once, when they come across a second instance, then they realize, oh, it's a repetitive task. For instance, you might receive an email with a PDF attachment. Your goal might be to take each line item inside the PDF attachment and put it in your CRM system. But then a week down the line, you receive another such email, and so forth. Now, these are the cases where it will be good to have a system that non-intrusively watches what you're doing. And the moment it figures out a couple of patterns, repetitive patterns, then it can automatically make suggestions for automating other instances of that kind of task. So let me show you a demo of this modeless synthesis capability in the context of repetitive code editing inside your IDE. So here I have some code inside Visual Studio that has different expressions for temperature conversion. So let's say I want to now replace these expressions by a new library routines that I have written for temperature conversions. So I'm converting F to C. And then I go and delete the rest of the expression. Then I'm trying to find where else in my code there are such patterns. Aha, I find one more. Here I'll maybe first delete. And then introduce the operator. And the moment I do this, so look at the bottom. The underlying engine is watching what I'm trying to do, and I could have done that in any kind of order. I could have done other kinds of edits in between. But it will learn from these noisy traces that there are other instances which I need to fix. And if I go to those, it provides me the right suggestion, which I can then accept and get the fix that I intended. So as I mentioned to you, when I worked on Flash Fill, the Excel team told me that unless I make the system work with one example in many simple cases, 
they will not ship flash fill. Recently, I was challenged to make this even better. So how much better can you make a system than one example? How about zero examples? Well, initially, I thought that this was a crazy suggestion. But then when I thought, it made a lot of sense in a specific domains. For instance, let's say you want to extract a table out of a web page. And there might be you know, 20 such fields. Now giving one to two examples of each field is definitely better having to write CSS selectors and understand the structure of the web page. But the tabular structure is immediately clear to a human being, even without any examples. So why can't a machine do that? And it turns out that you can leverage the presence of large number of inputs to be able to accomplish this. So this is very much like unsupervised learning versus supervised learning in machine learning. You might want to, let's say, join two different tables on columns that don't exactly match. So instead of using flash fill to convert a column into a different column that matches, even these kinds of transformations can be done with just zero examples. Maybe sorting or even splitting. So let me show you a demo around the splitting of uh, strings. So how many fields do you think are inside each of the strings in this column? Three. Right? You can extract those fields by giving one to two examples to flash fill. But if human beings can figure out that if the task is to split and there are three fields, all that you need to do is to be able to tell the tool to split the column, and the tool will try to understand the structure and give you these splits uh, completely automatically. And then the last innovation relates to getting something more than the intended program in the underlying domain-specific language. How about getting a language, getting the program in a language of your choice? So one feedback that we heard from data scientists and developers using FlashFill is that it's too magical. They would like to have full transparency with the system underneath, because if you want to deploy these synthesized programs on large inputs, large number of inputs or on streaming data, you would better want to make sure that it is doing exactly what you intended. And this is now what we have been focusing on recently to generate readable programs in a target language of your choice. And one other big benefit that comes with this is that now you can start integrating these technologies inside your existing workflows, such as IDEs or notebooks. And interestingly, this also has a lot of educational value. So let me show you my last demo, where I will showcase how these technologies can be integrated inside notebooks and be used to produce readable Python code. So the task at hand is to analyze the 911 calls data set. This is the data set that contains details of various emergency calls. And this data set is available in this CSV format, 911.csv. Now the first step in analyzing a data set like this would be to ingest it into a tabular form that I can then visualize and do some analysis over. In Python, this is often done using the popular pandas library. So how many of you here uh, have used this library called pandas in Python? So quite a few of you here. And it specifically is read CSV API. So let me use the read CSV API of pandas to read this 911.csv file. Oops, something went wrong. Hmm. Does someone know uh, what might be wrong? I was simply trying to read a CSV file using the read CSV API. Oh, that's a good idea. Let's take a look at the CSV file. 
aha, this is not a pure CSV file. There is some metadata at the top, and then there's a list of column names that I need to properly account for by passing the right set of arguments to the read CSV API. Turns out that this read CSV API has 50 parameters. So I can either go to Stack Overflow or look at Pandas documentation to figure out which of these parameters to use and provide the right arguments to the read CSV API. Instead, let's use program synthesis to the rescue. So one of the domains for which we have developed the program synthesis capabilities for is to ingest semi-structured documents into tabular form. And that capability has been exposed in this Pythonic manner called read, code accelerator, CX code accelerator dot read. And I simply pass the name of the file that I'm trying to read. And when I do that, it tries to understand the structure of this file and generates readable Python code for me to incorporate in my workflow. It has figured out that I need to skip 11 rows. It has figured out the list of the column names at the beginning. It has figured out what the delimiter is. It has figured out the right quoting semantics and so forth. So here in this case, maybe I saved a few minutes of a data scientist's time. But this read API is extremely powerful in two dimensions. One, it can not only handle CSV files, but also fixed width files, log files, custom text files, web pages, even PDF documents. And secondly, when the underlying AI is not smart enough to automatically generate the program from zero examples, then it provides an interactive mode where the user can give one to two examples of the various fields that they want to extract. And then in many of those cases, the system is still able to generate the right parsing code in order to lift the semi-structured document into a tabular form. So now back to this demo. So I can use this code and incorporate it inside my workflow to populate the Pandas data frame. And let's look at the data inside the data set. So it has a date column and a time column that corresponds to the timing of the emergency call. Suppose I want to figure out when are 911 calls most common. Is it on Monday mornings or Wednesday afternoons? So to be able to answer this question, I would need to create a new column where I would like to map the corresponding date to the weekday, which is Friday, as I know from my calendar. And I would like to map the corresponding time, 11 colon 11, into the corresponding, maybe let's say a four hour bucket to indicate late morning. Now just imagine how much code you will need to write to convert the strings in the date and time column to the new column that the data scientist wants. But thanks to the new FlashFill++ feature, all that I have to do is to give an example of what I want, and the underlying system generalizes the example into a program and runs this program on the data set to give you the output that you want, very much like FlashFill. But even more than FlashFill, it shows you code, readable Python code. This code has a lot of educational value as well. So now I know how to take a string and cast it as a date-time object. I never knew that this percentage A was the magic sequence of characters that I have to use to take a date-time object and convert it into the corresponding weekday. You can also edit this code. Instead of four-hour buckets, you can compute eight-hour buckets. And now I can use this code inside my workflow to compute the new column that I was trying to compute. And now all that is left is to plot the frequency counts of these various time buckets. Turns out that if you want to plot them in the implicit order of these buckets, you again have to do complicated data wrangling. And this is where intent can be very easily described using natural language. But while we are working on that capability, I have written this code by hand. And all that you need to do is to execute this to figure out when are 911 calls 
most common. So that's on Wednesdays, 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. And just imagine how much time it would have taken for you to draw these kinds of insights by having to do data wrangling yourself. But now with just a few clicks and a few keystrokes, you can accomplish this. So it turns out that notebooks are a match made in heaven for these kinds of program synthesis capabilities. Because program synthesis is good about generating small fragments of code. And this is what matches the cell-based granularity inside notebooks. Furthermore, program synthesis can generate code in various different target languages using various different kinds of libraries that the user might be familiar with or might not be familiar with, but they would like to generate code in those libraries. And this can address the challenge of polyglot programming or discoverability issues with new SDKs inside notebooks. Furthermore, deployment of successful program synthesis technologies also requires interactivity to resolve the ambiguity in the user's intent. And notebooks are an ideal platform for that kind of interactivity. So let me conclude now. So program synthesis is setting the foundation for the next generation of programming experiences. If you look at the history of programming, we went from punched cards and assembly language to high-level languages and beautiful code editors. The next transition will take programming much closer to human communication, where it will be very multimodal, involving use of examples and natural language. Interestingly, these concepts are already present in today's programming. Test cases are nothing but input-output examples. Comments are nothing but natural language-based specifications. And now in the future, these concepts will become first-class citizens to author code itself. And this will facilitate two kinds of disruptions. One, 100x more programmers. Because 99% people today who use computers do not know programming. These are not stupid people, except that programming languages are very much of an artificial barrier for these pro people to be much more creative in their lives and to accomplish more. Secondly, these very same technologies will improve the productivity of existing developers and data scientists by 10 to 100x in many domains. Because most of the code that we write today is just boilerplate code. It's plumbing code. There is very little algorithmic creativity that goes inside the code that we write. And there's a huge potential for automating that. The underlying technologies beneath program synthesis combine cutting edge advances in logical reasoning and symbolic reasoning. These are the techniques that became popular in the first wave of AI and are also behind many different static program analysis tools and machine learning, which is the ongoing revolution in AI. And I believe that much more technical disruption will come if we put these two different styles of techniques together, logical reasoning and statistical techniques uh, in the form of machine learning. So we have been working towards putting together an SDK for developing these program synthesizers. And I believe that use of frameworks like these shall evolve the process of writing new libraries to that of writing new synthesizers for those domains. So I hope you enjoyed this peek into the future of programming and that some of you will help shape this future by writing these kinds of program synthesizers yourself. Thank you. Uh, hi, we're involved in creating a convert string in PowerShell, if you know what I mean. Yes. And uh, will it evolve as a function? Uh, and can it do all the stuff that you showed in Excel? Thank yes, you. yes. So the convert string utility was shipped by my pros team. 
and it is based on a much older version of this technology. Uh, and we haven't gotten around to refreshing that capability yet. But for those of you who do not know about these two commandlets, convert string and convert from string, these are the capabilities to drive a new column, the flash fill capability, which is inside Excel. We also put it inside PowerShell, where you can, on the command line, given input-output example, and then get back a pointer to a function, which can execute the intended transformation on other inputs. And the other functionality allows you to extract tabular data from log files or text files. Uh, the challenge with putting these experiences the way they have been inside PowerShell is that the usability is not very uh, clean. And there have been, we get many emails where people talk about the functionality not working. It is just that they have not been invoking it uh, properly. Uh, so there are two innovations that need to be done on that front. One is to improve the usability experience. And the second is to take our last many years of advances and use those instead of these old technologies. So there are plans to do that, right? Uh, uh, I cannot speak to that uh, right now. But we are very actively working towards uh, this code accelerator experience uh, for notebooks. And uh, hopefully, that might be one way for you to programmatically access uh, these technologies. But I cannot speak to when uh, would they be released. It's a great presentation, Samit. Uh, congratulations, it was very inspiring. So maybe um, I would, I had a pleasure uh, talking with you before this conference, uh, before this speech of yours started, and you uh, mentioned outstanding story about empathy. Uh, I thought it's really worth it, and uh, you might uh, share it with a broader auditorium if you like. And maybe can you correlate that with with this? AI technologies and the future of programming. Thank you. So earlier uh, in the morning, uh, there was this talk on, or this was uh, the keynote yesterday, on uh, uh, design thinking. And then I asked a question at the, the end about uh, how should that shape the experiences inside uh, classrooms for students? And someone can even ask me, you know, should we stop teaching programming to kids now? Because programs will be automatically uh, generated. So my belief along that dimension is that there are two very important skills to teach to students, one of which is what I will call computational thinking. And this was a term that was coined by Janet Wing. Many people in the world you know, do not even precisely understand the meaning of the phrase if x, then y. And being able to understand you know, some of this and reason about things in a logical way can play a big role towards creating more peace on the, on the planet. The second thing, which I believe is also quite important, is what I would call teaching empathy. And maybe I would like to coin a term empathic thinking, if it's not already there. In fact, my biggest uh, life-changing moment came in my career, halfway in my uh, career, after 10 years of a 20-year-long professional career, when I met this airplane lady, which I would think was a good example of being empathetic towards the uh, customer. And that's when I spent three months studying health forums, trying to figure out what problem should I solve next as opposed to three weeks that it took me to develop the first version of uh, prototype, the flash fill prototype. So some of my own experiences in empathy, and, and Satya, uh, by the way, uh, talks about empathy quite a lot, which is very inspirational. And my own uh, uh, inspiration in this, on this topic has come from some of my parenting experiences, and that's what you were mentioning, <laughs> the story that you know, I, I can consider describing. So I have a six-year-old child, and when he was four years old, I wanted to teach him his first math theorem. So the theorem that I picked was that when you add two odd numbers, it becomes an even number. So the first evening, I tried to use lots of examples on pen and paper. 
And of course, I'm the by example guy, so examples come, of course, very naturally to me. But it didn't work. The next evening, I thought, I need to make it much more fun. So I took out many different toys that I had in my house related to numbers and used them instead. But unfortunately, he struggled. And I was also very disappointed. It didn't, it didn't work again. So before giving up, the next evening, I tried a different experiment. So this time, I used neither pen and paper nor toys. I just used words. I told him a story. I told him, look, an odd number is made up of guys that are all paired with each other, except that there is one lonely guy. So when you bring two odd numbers together, the two lonely guys pair up with each other and become friends. And he immediately got it. So when I asked him, what's odd plus even? He says, with great sadness, it's odd. Why? Because there is no one to pair the lonely guy in the odd number with. When I ask him, what's even plus even? He's very happy and say, even, because there's no lonely guy to begin with. Then I shared this story with a storytelling instructor. And he begged me to allow him to use this story in the book that he wanted to write next. But he told me one thing about why this story registered with my child, who was five years old at the time. He said, kids are very scared of being lonely. So that's why he was completely plugged in when you were explaining him it this way. So I decided to test it out one evening. So it was after dinner. We were about to go to sleep. He was busy on his iPad programming his robots. Sumer, it's time to go to sleep. Let's go up. No response. I raised my voice. Sumer, we need to go to bed now. Can you please turn it off? Still no response. Sumer, I'm going up now, but I'll be lonely on the odd floor up. And then he immediately turns it off, holds my hand, and says, Papa, let's go up. So I get my lessons in empathy from painting experiences like this. And turns out that small children have a lot of empathy in them. But the trouble is that this ends up getting dust as we grow up. And if we can be more conscious about this skill, then we can interact better with customers. We can interact better with diverse teams, which is the real, the, the real demand of, uh, of these times. So sorry, that was a bit of a digression. Thank but you. Thank you, Sumit. So uh, we don't have, unfortunately, any more time for questions, but you can always grab Sumit later on our matinee party. Uh, soon we'll proceed towards the closing ceremony, so stick around. No, okay. <laughs> I have to get hooked up. Okay. Just give me a sec.